Grimes. I'm the director here of the Center for American Studies and Research for a couple more weeks. Um, and uh, I just want to tell you about a couple of other things and then I'll introduce this evening's uh, speaker. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, uh, Adam Abel, um, who is a, a video artist and a documentary filmmaker, will be here to give a talk called Palestine Interrupted. Um, it will, uh, he'll talk about uh, two things. One is a series of uh, videos, which you'll notice are up on the panels of AB's announcement panels throughout campus, um, uh, that were shot in West Bank. Uh, and he'll also talk about um, a, a film that he's finishing. I kind of compare it to so, uh, Hoop Dreams. I don't know if you know that documentary film. It's sort of the Hoop Dreams of the West Bank. It's about a skateboarding crew from a town called Colchilia on the West Bank. It was entirely encircled by the wall. And he's followed a skateboard uh, crew. Um, uh, he followed them for an extensive period and is finishing. He's in the sort of final stages of that documentary film. So he'll show us some of that, talk about his uh, video work. Then our final uh, speaker will be, uh, one week from today, Tonya Pinkins. Um, he's probably best known for the Tony Award she won for Jelly Slash Jam uh, on Broadway, uh, directed by George Wolfe, and she was in uh, Tony Kushner's Caroline or Change. Uh, and she's been uh, in the theater literally for the last 30 years, uh, a fabulously interesting sort of trajectory of uh, her experience as a woman, as an African American uh, singer, artist, whatever. She's going to come and, and, and talk to us about uh, uh, her life in the, doing everything from theater to, I think, Days of Our Lives, so, uh, you know, whatever, uh, soap opera. So um, that's one week from. Uh, today, uh, at the same time, 5.30. Uh, so uh, tonight's guest is uh, Lisa Parks, who is a professor of film and media studies at UC Santa Barbara, where she's currently the director of the Center for Information Technology and Society. Um, she's conducted research on uses of media and information technologies in different national contexts, most recently in Zambia. Her work is highly interdisciplinary and engages with fields such as geography, international relations, communication, and art. Uh, she's the author of Cultures in Orbit, Satellites, and the Tevisual uh, Televisual from Duke, um, Vertical Mediation and the War on Terror, uh, which is forthcoming, uh, Mixed Signals, Media Infrastructures, and Cultural Geographies, which is in progress, and she's the co-editor of Signal Traffic, Critical Studies of Media Infrastructure from the University of Illinois, Down to Earth, Satellite Technologies, Industries and Cultures from Rutgers and Planet TV, a global television, uh, yes, did I, yeah, a global television, something Reader. Is, reader, thank you. <laughs> thought there was a word missing, thank you. Um, and um, uh, this evening, she is going to uh, talk to us uh, about uh, drone media and matters in the Horn of Africa. So welcome. So wonderful to have you here. Thanks so much, uh, everybody, for coming today. I'm trying to think what the best format will be here. Maybe I will stand. Um, I want to say thank you to the Edward Said Chair in American Studies, Lisa Hajar, and also to Robert and um, students and faculty here at the Center for American Studies and Research, and also some artists, emerging artists in, in Beirut who are here that I've been working with. Um, so uh, t what I'm presenting today is part of the book that I'm trying to finish up called Coverage, Vertical Mediation, and the War on Terror. And this uh, is part of a chapter that comes toward the end um, of this book. So I'm just going to present from manuscript. And it's, it relies quite a bit on the images. So I hope you can see them. If you have any issues with it, maybe let me know. But I, I talk a little louder. OK, talk louder. All right. Because the mic goes to the camera. OK. All right, you guys can hear me back there, OK? Yes. OK, good. All right, during the past decade, the United States has waged counterterrorism campaigns in Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen, using drones as instruments of surveillance, reconnaissance, intelligence, and targeted killing. 
Though these operations have been ongoing since 2001, they first made U.S. news headlines in 2009 when investigative reporter Jane Mayer published a detailed expose about the CIA's secret drone war in Pakistan and The New Yorker. Since then, a whirlwind of public commentary has emerged on drone technology and warfare. Policy experts have deliberated the legalities of drone war. UN teams have conducted special investigations. Activists have waged protests and demonstrations. And news agencies have tracked the technology's multifarious uses. So much drone commentary has surfaced in recent years that Karen Kaplan has referred to it as the, quote, drone-arama. Drone intrigue has also struck the U.S. Congress, which now runs a, quote, unmanned systems caucus, or the drone caucus, made up of 60 members from 30 different states across the United States. Since 2008, members of the caucus have pulled in more than $8 million in campaign contributions from drone manufacturers such as Northrop Grumman, General Atomics, and Lockheed Martin. Drone manufacturers' collusion with politicians and entrepreneurs has not only authorized billions of federal funds for the purchase of predators, reapers, and global hawks, but has ramped up and rolled out civilian drone uses, ranging from drone delivery of pizzas uh, to Amazon packages. Um, you, maybe you, some of you have read about this in, in, the, in the press, that there are all these new kind of civilian uses of drones, which are part of a process of trying to legitimate uh, the use of the technology and, and rolling it out. Beyond investigative reports and entrepreneurial antics, scholars have explored the drone's relation to robotics and autonomous warfare, international law, including Lisa Hajar, who's written about this, um, and visual regimes of power. In such research, scholars often adopt descriptions of drones as unmanned or autonomous, as foundational assumptions, fixating upon their video game-like features, their terminal interfaces, or capacities for remote control without considering the material conditions or contingencies that undergird their operation. The overvaluation or fetishization of the drone as unmanned or autonomous has the effect of sanctioning statecraft that takes the form of unilateralism or authorizing wars that are waged extrajudicially. For how could autonomous machines ever do anything but act of their own accord? And how could we ever expect to be responsible or accountable for what they do? This unquestioned investment in machine autonomy also runs counter to post-structuralist feminist critiques of science and technology, which for decades have conceptualized machines and humans and other life forms as integrated circuits, as dynamic technosocial relations. Building upon these critiques and recent work on the politics of verticality, and here I'm thinking of work by I.L. Weisman, um, as well as Peter Schlotterdijk and Ray Chow, um, this paper analyzes the materialities of U.S. drone operations in the Horn of Africa. Since 2002, the U.S. Joint Special Operations Command, and from here on I'll call them JSOC, um, and CIA have orchestrated a covert, a covert drone war from Camp Lemonnier in the small African country of Djibouti, monitoring and striking alleged Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab suspects in Yemen and Somalia. According to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, uh, th these are some of the numbers from the end of 2014. I won't read all of these, but this is um, material that's kind of meticulously gathered from this uh, NGO called the um, Bureau of Investigative Journalism based in the UK. Um, so uh, these are the numbers of uh, how many people have been uh, killed and um, how many drone strikes have occurred. These are, are higher at this point in time. These were taken at the end of last year. So as a media scholar, you might be thinking, oh, she's a media, a film and media scholar. Why is she interested in this? Well, I'm getting to that. So as a media scholar, I'm interested in both the discourses people develop and use to expose and interpret covert US drone interventions and in the ways that drones themselves function as technologies of mediation. 
Um, by mediation, I am referring not only to the, pass the capacity of drone sensors to detect phenomenon on the Earth's surface so it can be rendered as live video feeds at terminal interfaces, but also to the potential to material materially alter or affect the phenomenon of the air, spectrum, and or ground. Like Sarah Kember and Joanna Zelinska, I understand mediation as a process that far exceeds the screen and involves the capacity to register the dynamism of occurrences within, upon, or in relation to myriad materials, objects, sites, surfaces, or bodies on Earth. As a drone flies through the sky, it alters the chemical composition of the air. As it hovers above the earth, it can change movements on the ground. As it projects announcements through loudspeakers, it can affect thought and behavior. And as it shoots hellfire missiles, it can turn homes into holes and the living into the dead. So much more than a sensor, the drone is a technology of vertical mediation. The traces, transmissions, and targets of its operations are registered through the air, the spectrum, and on the ground. Irreducible to the screen's visual display, the drone's mediating work happens extensively and dynamically through the vertical field, through a vast expanse that extends from the Earth's surface, including the geological layers below and built environments upon it, through the domains of the spectrum and the air to the outer limits of orbit. To explore the drone's mediating work, I rely upon three registers, the infrastructural, the perceptual, and the forensic. And I draw upon media such as Google Earth interfaces, training manual diagrams, infrared images, and drone crash scene photos to convey how and where vertical mediations take shape. Rather than approach these media as sites of representation, I treat them as demonstrations of the materializing capacities and effects of drone interventions, as sites where the drone's relation to the material world becomes intelligible, vivid, palpable, and contestable. And ultimately, I argue that the power of the drone is not just to hunt and kill from afar, but to secure territories and administer populations from the sky to reorder, reform, and remediate life on Earth in a most material way. In this way, drone technologies for me are much more like 3D printers than video games. They sculpt as much as they sense. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through these three sections. That was kind of the intro and setup. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about, I'll kind of sketch out what I mean by the infrastructural. Djibouti is a small nation on the east coast of Africa, bordered by Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia. Its capital city, Djibouti City, sits on the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, along a key shipping corridor targeted by Somali pirates over the past decade. A former French colony, Djibouti asserted its independence in 1977, and over the past 36 years has had only two presidents. Of the country's 860,000 citizens, 97% are Muslim and 48% are unemployed. A country with scant natural resources, Djibouti lives off the bonanza rents it garners from its geostrategic location. And this situation has created a government inclined toward authoritarianism, highly consolidated power, and repressive tactics. Djibouti also has a poor record on human rights and civil liberties, and the state tightly restricts media and civil society organizations, though there have been major demonstrations against the ruling regime since 2011 due to allegations of election fraud. So you will see um, uh, periodically huge gatherings like this in Djibouti city where people are contesting the results of um, various elections that are happening. Um, and in, in some sense, this was also part of a broader regional pattern uh, associated that people refer to as the quote unquote Arab Spring. In 2001, months before 9-11, the US military entered into conversations uh, to establish a base in Djibouti as part of an effort to respond to Al-Qaeda groups allegedly operating training centers in Yemen and Somalia. The result was Camp Le Monnier, a 500-acre base located at Djibouti's international airport in an area once used by the French Foreign Legion. 
Described by the Pentagon as the backbone of counterterrorism in the region, the annual budget for Le Monnier is 300 million US dollars. I think it's higher than that now. It's been jacked up in the recent uh, last year. And the US pays Djibouti $38 million a year to lease space for this, this base. Working with the CIA, JSOC, and JSOC Horn of Africa, um, they, JSOC Horn of Africa leads these counterterrorism -terror efforts and serves as an organizational hub or a revolutionary motor of networked warfare in the region, often using the drone as its centerpiece. Though U.S. operations in Djibouti remain classified, parts of their infrastructure is visible in Google Earth. Digital Globe satellite images pinpoint Camp Le Monnier, as well as the um, Chabeli airstrip located just outside of Djibouti city, where predators and re uh, this is the main airport uh, that's visible in Google Earth, and this is the airstrip that's used by the US for the predators and reapers that take off and land and conduct um, drone operations, reconnaissance and targeted killings throughout the region. Drone operations are predicated upon computing and telecommunication networks, but they are also contingent upon a multitude of other kinds of resources that we often don't think about when we just think of these as unmanned remote control systems. So they, they need ground, you know, earth, air, orbit, spectrum, labor, energy. And um, what you see, if you look at this, I mean, I, I, when I look at these, I think of like the acts of little bulldozing and earth moving and the, the built environments that undergird this kind of system of vertical mediation. Um, so in addition to acts of earth moving, um, there, there's all kinds of equipment installations and maintenance on the ground needed to build and operate these airstrips in the desert. And all of the drones that move into the region go in these what look like almost, you know, caskets <laughs> um, that are taken on train or via uh, truck and secretly in these containers and moved into this area and then unveiled and set onto the runway. And there's all kinds of, um, you know, like physical manhandling and mechanical hands-on tactile labor, people on the ground that's needed to sustain and orchestrate this form of warfare. It's not just people playing a video game. There are all kinds of very localized forms of land appropriation, um, leases, contracts, human labor, that's executing all of this as well. And so, as you can probably gather, part of my intention is to really think through some of these materialities on the ground and to dislocate some of the broader discourses of thinking about this just as a, as a video game played out from afar. Um, the US military, I showed you some of the Google Earth images in Djibouti, but the U.S. also has um, 29 agreements to use international airports in Africa as refueling stations for its, its U.S. military aircraft. And these are other strips that it uses, one in the Seychelles, uh, another in Ethiopia, uh, and I, I'm not sure exactly where that one is, but throughout the whole region. Um, so, so you see that it's there are physical things happening to the earth in Africa, which also falls on the tail of a whole history of colonialism in the region. So while Google Earth spotlights US drone infrastructure in and around Djibouti, military training manual diagrams also demonstrate the drone's vertical mediations. These are kind of designed to educate drone crews about operational scenarios. And these diagrams portray drones performing defensive, offensive, what they call stability and civil support missions. Um, in the military imaginary, the drone becomes this kind of center point of coordinated activities fluidly orchestrated through aerial, orbital, spectral, and terrestrial domains. Here the drone is figured as a kind of media technology par excellence as it facilitates re relations between terrain vehicles and satellites, provides aerial surveillance for ground operations, guides missiles to targets, and drops messages to civilians. Sometimes they actually have these loudspeakers where they're blaring out through the air audio messages, or they will drop paper messages as well into to particular areas. So, um, 
this mediating machine, this, it, it's kind of like this extensive life and death support system, uh, appropriates the vertical field as the medium of its movements, transmissions, inscriptions, and projections. And as these kinds of diagrams suggest, the drone's theater of operations is contingent upon a robust yet scattered constellation of communication and global positioning satellites, fiber optic internet links, computer equipped earth stations, all of which must be electrified. So beyond even these runways and stuff, the, the, there's a whole other layer of dependency on the electrical grid and the integration of it into these remote areas, which the US military often <coughs> subsidizes. So putting this extensive and multi-tiered infrastructure in place not only takes time and money, but requires access to land, spectrum, and sky, um, and is contingent upon a dizzying array of contracts, agreements, and leases with host countries, who by taking US money and offering their land, implicitly authorize the US military to do what it does, even if it creates adverse conditions for citizens in the region, in, whether in Djibouti or other countries nearby. Given the broad reach and capacities of U.S. drone infrastructures, it's impossible to distinguish them from other systems around the world, whether energy grids or t telecommunication networks. In 2014, investigative journalists Jeremy Scahill and Glenn Greenwald published an expose revealing that U.S. military drones are equipped with virtual base tower transceivers. So this is like if you had a cell phone tower in the drone so that you can do all kinds of, um, all kinds of things that I'll get to in a second. Um, and so these transceivers um, enable them to, the drone to intercept commercial mobile phone traffic and quote, suck up data for the NSA, the National Security Administration. These drone-based transceivers function as a fake cell phone tower that forces targeted mobile devices to lock onto an NSA receiver without the user's knowledge. Thus, as US military drones hover above, they conduct signal intelligence, intercepting the proprietary data of commercial mobile telephone providers and users, and traffic all of this data right into NSA clouds. Um, in this scenario, the drone becomes part of an extractive information economy, functioning as a digital vacuum cleaner or a flying data miner. Um, though these transceivers were ostensibly put in place to help authenticate suspects before U.S. drone strikes, Greenwald and Scahill reveal that attacks have been authorized again and again based upon mobile phone metadata alone leading to killings of unidentified suspects, a situation that they refer to as, quote unquote, death by metadata. So they'll have target lists with people's actual names, but they might not be able to authenticate whether the cell phone metadata corresponds with an individual's name. And so what, what uh, Scahill and Gr Greenwald significantly pointed out, their report cites a former drone pilot who explains quote, it's really like we're targeting a cell phone. We're not going after people, we're going after their phones in the hopes that the person on the other end of that missile is the bad guy, end quote. So they did some interviews with former drone pilots who took great risks to come forward with this information. Um, this practice is emerged, this, this kind of practice of death by metadata as it's known, emerged as part of a JSOC and CIA paradigm that was first tested during the war in the former Yugoslavia. And this program was called FEAD or F3EAD, which stands for Find, Fix, Finish, Exploit, Analyze, Disseminate. Feed, as they call it, involves monitoring mobile phone communications to find suspects' exact locations and positioning drones above to provide, quote, deadly persistence until the suspect emerges. If the suspect is confirmed, lethal force is applied, and helicopters drop ground crews in immediately after a drone strike to exploit any physical evidence on the scene. So the intelligence is analyzed and disseminated across the network. Scahill describes the operational logic like this, quote, 
We can kill you if we don't know your identity. But once we kill you, we want to figure out who it is we killed, end quote. So preemptive targeted killings are met with retrospective confirmations. I mean, this is kind of the, this is part of the materialities also of this paradigm of drone warfare, um, where you do have um, helicopter crews kind of sweeping in and gathering all evidence of what has been done. So this, uh, this feed strategy positions Africans in general and Yemenis and Somalis in particular at the treacherous infrastructural crossroads of mobile communication and U.S. drone operations. During Africa's first decade of mobile telephony, consumers could purchase multiple SIM cards from different mobile phone networks without registration. However, now most it's all but three African countries have adopted mandatory SIM card registration policies requiring consumers to provide personal identification when purchasing a SIM card, which is needed to activate a mobile phone. So given this, there's growing concern about the potential for SIM card databases to be used in security and policing, including the formation of JSOC and CIA target lists. Um, this, is, this is almost like a, a footnote that becomes a whole other paper. And there's an excellent article about this issue in a journal called First Monday, if you're interested in kind of the politics of surveillance and mobile telephony in Africa at the, in the current historical moment. So given, uh, so in Yemen, you have, uh, oh, these are some, some of the images of people registering their SIM cards. Um, in Yemen, 58 out of 100 people use mobile phones and there are four providers. In Somalia, 23 out of 100 people use mobile phones and there are six different providers. So simply by having a SIM card, using a mobile phone, or being in the vicinity of others using mobile phones, Somali and Yemeni people increase the risk of being targeted by a drone. Um, so we, what I'm trying to do here is think about infrastructurally a, a relational model that thinks about how drone warfare is predicated on an appropriation of, you know, what we think of is we, everybody has to have a smartphone in their hand. There's a way in which there's a relational structure taking place um, and if you look at the operational scenarios and patterns of developing these lists. So in response uh, to these infrastructural intersections, people on the ground have devised various tactics. In an effort to encourage critical reflection on the death by metadata practice, web developer Josh Begley created an iPhone app called Metadata Plus which Apple rejected five times and refused to distribute, um, that informs the user each time the US conducts a drone strike, enabling people to track and respond to the strikes. In regions of US drone operations, people use multiple SIM cards, sometimes up to six a day, to create confusion about users' identities. Um, in Somalia, Al-Shabaab has actually reportedly stopped using mobile phones. This was for a while, I think they're now using them again, and halted others' access as well. And in early 2014, members of the organization stormed into the headquarters of one of Somalia's largest mobile phone providers, Hormud Telecom, you see the building here, and um, stormed in with weapons and demanded that the network be shut down, claiming the organization was being used by Western spy agencies to collect information on Muslims throughout the region. Al-Shabaab has also confiscated and banned the use of camera-equipped smartphones, claiming that they are used to spy on Muslims. So, so there are all kinds of ways in which these practices then change uh, what's happening on the, the ground. So just to sum up this section then, um, while satellite images can kind of render intelligible the drone infrastructure's material transformation of the Earth's surface and training diagrams convey its vertical layers and extensions, this death by metadata scenario reveals how strategic uses of drone infrastructure alter the status of mobile telephony systems on the ground. 
um, reshaping the policies of mobile phone providers, the behavior of their users, and the operations of their networks. So there are really specific material transformations taking place in commercial or state-run mobile phone systems because of US drone operations. The second section I'll go through is called the, the perceptual. In addition to remediating how people communicate and live on the ground, drone operations reorganize human perception of and interaction with material phenomena. Like its precursors, the U-2 spy plane and the remote sensing satellite, the drone is equipped with electro-optical and infrared sensors that detect electromagnetic radiation that's reflected off of or emanating from the Earth's surface. And as such, it participates in what Jeremy Packer calls a radiographic episteme by turning imperceptible radiation into data that can be made productive within an information economy. So it is the drone's detection of infrared radiation that I wish to focus upon here as it brings other material dimensions of vertical <coughs> mediation into relief and demarcates a shift in the technologized perception of racial difference and death. When drone crews began their um, work in a designated, designated mission area, they build a picture, they say they build a picture of conditions on the ground. And the sensor operator often begins this process by actually using Google Earth imagery to determine how a given mission area should look from above and then positions the drone sensor ball to acquire optimal views of the area. The goal, as one pilot puts it, is to, quote, get the ball over the target, end quote. While this process is often imagined as a simple act of button pushing, um, Tim Cullen's recently declassified yet heavily redacted ethnography of reaper crews, re this, is, this is what the document looks like. There's little kernels of useful information. This is a guy that worked in the Navy and he wrote a whole dissertation on re reaper drone crews. So you'll, this is how it looks to read it and I show it just because sometimes this is how you have to do research. You glean little bits of information even though a lot of it might bl be blocked from your view. Um, but the, this heavily redacted ethnography of Reaper crews reveals that sensor operators are often completely overwhelmed by the multiple views and different kinds of information they must engage with during drone operations. He writes, quote, coordinating the cacophony of displays and paper products at a workstation requires discipline and skill, and sensor operators said it took up to half a year or more to master how to correlate information from redacted maps and imagery with objects on the display and um, images on the head-up display, end quote. So those who managed to master the hand-eye coordination needed to acquire good overhead views become known as having, quote unquote, golden hands. Um, since U.S. drone operations often occur at night, infrared sensors are useful because they allow crews to see through darkness and clouds. <laughs> And here we have to say see because they're not like seeing vi optical light. They're seeing heat. It's a, it's a visualization of heat, right? So um, though infrared drone imagery of U.S. counterterrorism campaigns is classified, the CIA and JSOC have used infrared imaging to track and target Osama bin Laden and U.S. citizens Anwar al-Awlaki and Samir Khan, as well as more than 4,000 alleged terror suspects and civilians in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia during the past decade. In the U.S., um, Homeland Security, Border Patrol, and law enforcement officers have used aerial infrared sensors to monitor activity along U.S. borders. To, and they've also d done this to uh, bolster um, urban and rural policing. Here you see this predator permitted airspace uh, in the northern part of the US on the Canadian border, but there's also a space on the southern border with Me Mexico. So these are also being used to bolster urban and rural policing and locate, they've used it to locate and apprehend Boston bombing suspect uh, Zo Zohar Sarnaev. Um, you, maybe you've seen this image in the news media. Um, in such operations, the drone stare is mobilized in a hunt for heat 
fixed on heat-bearing objects such as bodies, guns, missiles, explosives, tanks, anti-aircraft vehicles, trucks, and power generators. Within such conditions, the universal human condition of body temperature becomes a liability. Within such conditions, uh, sorry, drone imagery is calibrated to visualize infrared emissions such that human bodies pop out in the visual field as white or black blotches, depending on the image processing selections of stasis or movement. In low light conditions, human bodies are not only easier to see, but also to track and target. Um, so within this radiographic episteme, surveillance practices are extended beyond just the surface of the skin. Skin color, which is about the whole history of racism and surveillance, is about epidermalization. Um, it, so it's extended beyond epidermalization because infrared energy can be used to isolate suspects according to the energy emitted by their bodies. While other systems of human differentiation are organized around skin color, personal information, and biometrics, aerial infrared imagery turns all bodies into indistinct human morphologies that cannot be differentiated according to conventional visible light indicators of gender, <coughs> race. You can even sometimes read class through visible light. So seeing according to temperature turns everyone into a potential suspect or target and has the effect of normalizing surveillance since all bodies appear similar beneath its gaze. At the same time, however, it is important to point out that temperature data has become visible precisely so that it can be made productive within existing regimes of power. Even as it displaces the visible light or epidermal registers of ethnic racial difference, drone infrared imaging reinforces already existing power hierarchies by monitoring and targeting certain territories and peoples, such as those in Pakistan along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, Yemen and Somalia, or along US borders with greater frequency and intensity, designating these areas and peoples as hot spots that need to be preemptively contained. So strategies of ethnic and racial differentiation do not disappear within an aerial system of temperature-based visuality. Rather, they are restructured along a vertical axis of power and recodified according to issues such as moving to or being in certain places at certain times, being in the vicinity of other suspects, driving certain kinds of vehicles, or carrying certain objects with certain tem temperatures or shapes or sizes. Um, racializing logics and social sorting persist as certain people's territories, bodies, movements, and information are selected for monitoring, tracking, and targeting day after day. Cha people's disposition to the sky is changed by this too, right? So. Um, certain people are tracked, targeted day after day, month after month, year after year, such that they become what, what I refer to as spectral sub suspects. Spectral suspects. And if you think of that image, you know, where you're looking down at the heat image, of, this is the, the, the kind of iconography of the spectral suspect. Visualizations of temperature data that take on the biophysical contours of a human body while its surface appearance remains invisible and the identity usually unknown and, and has to be confirmed by ground level intelligence or corroborated in some way. Okay. So such, a, such processes reorganize the racialized gaze such that black African and brown Arab bodies once discriminated against and or exoticized on the basis of skin pigment are digitally reformed as white or black blotches of body heat um, tracked from above. Um, the effect of this vertical remediation of racial difference is to mainstay counterterrorism as a social order. For it is precisely the issue of not being able to verify or confirm the identities of suspects that fuels counterterrorism as a paradigm and drone warfare as its method. The recoding of racial difference as thermal abstraction thus becomes infrastructural as it rationalizes and drives the drone economy. 
This way of perceiving racial difference has other effects as well. Former censor operator Bryant Brandon publicly shared his experiences with reporters in 2013 after manning a censor ball at Creech and Cannon Air Force bases from 2007 to 2011, working on US drone operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Yemen, and participating directly in the killing of 1,626 people, which when he was told that astounded him, but he was told that as a kind of you know, badge of honor. But when he found out that number, he decided to quit. He, he, it freaked him out so much. Working in 12-hour shifts, six days a week, drone crews partake in an endless loop of watching, scanning roads, circling compounds, tracking suspicious activity, shifting between visible light and infrared registers to get the best possible view. <clears throat> When the mission is to monitor a high value target, a sensor operator might linger above a single house for weeks. Far from being an exercise in objectification, this focused monitoring, Derek Gregory has suggested, generates a, quote, voyeuristic intimacy. And um, Brandon's perceptions of the thermal mediascape as a drone operator had a profound effect on him. He recounts his drone memories in infrared. So you have to imagine what it would be like to sit there laboring, like these, looking at these images so much that when you have a kind of photo recall of your own past, instead of seeing it in a visible light register, you see it as infrared register. And that's what happened to him. He recounts his drone memories in infrared, detailing the first time he killed someone via drone and watching the body's hot blood hit the ground and, quote, start to cool off, um, tasked to linger above this site and conduct surveillance for an after-action report, Brandon recall, recalls, it took him a long time to die. I just watched him. I watched him become the same color as the ground he was lying on. This isn't an actual image of that. It's just there as a suggestion. Um, but I want us to start sort of think about like, like race, death looks different in the thermal mediascape. When a body is killed, its motion stops and its temperature drops. As the body slowly takes on the temperature values of the matter surrounding it, it loses its contour and it recedes into the visual field. So drone infrared imagery depicts race as abstract whiteness or blackness, depending on the image processing selections, and death as literal disappearance. So if you can imagine these three people were just struck by a drone, if you looked at the image long enough, the heat would vanish from their bodies and they would recede into that background. And so the body itself within that thermal mediascape, the dead body, literally disappears. Um, it will take some time for the temperature to reduce and become the same temperature as the ground surrounding it. Um, so just as people have responded to death by metadata practices, so too have they devised a plethora of counter-infrared imaging tactics. Tactics. Some have created drone survival guides that encourage people to avoid becoming part of drone views, so they're able to recognize what these things look like in the sky. Um, others have experimented with deflective and insulating materials such as glass, wool, blankets, rugs, tinfoil, and synthetically designed fabrics that trap or hide heat even if temporarily so that it cannot be detected when drones are hovering above. And this is a guy who operates in Mali, where US and French uh, drones are deployed to fight Al-Qaeda operators in uh, northern Mali. And he sells these, um, these kind of carpets made out of reed so that people who are out driving <coughs> around in that area, whether they're in Al-Qaeda or not, can hide their, their cars so they're not just instantly struck at night if they're moving in a certain area. Um, so they hide these and it, it has a temporary way of keeping the heat in, okay? Um, uh, New York artists Adam Harvey and Joanna Bloomfield designed a drone-proof clothing line called Stealthwear made of nickel metallized fabric. And there's a German company called Blucher that sells a special outfit called Ghost. Um, this, and when you put it on, you're able to be much more concealed. Not completely, but it helps to contain the body heat so it can't be sensed. 
Um, and, and, I mean, people have, I'm sure you've seen these, uh, lots of people have talked about these images, but still others in Pakistan have created massive art installations. This one's called Not a Bug Splat, placing giant images of children's faces on the Earth's surface to show drone operators that the anonymous white blobs seen from afar are anything but blug, bug splats which is how some drone crews have referred to them. They are human beings, including children. Um, okay. The last section is called the forensic. So even as drone infrared imaging participates in reorganizing the perception of race and death, the technology is not foolproof. Drones sometimes fail, and crash sites bring their vertical mediations into dialogue with the forensic. Since 2007, uh, the organization uh, Drone Wars UK has maintained a drone crash database compiled by gleaning details from U.S. Air Force Accident Investigation Board reports, the WikiLeaks war logs, and press reports. And while this database is not totally comprehensive due to the classification of much of this information, it does serve as a useful site for a starting point for extending this discussion of the material contingencies of drone operations. Failures and accidents bring drones plummeting fatally back to Earth, etching their inadvertent effects into grounded life worlds and biomatter. So sometimes, you know, a drone might be an incidental weapon rather than a targeted killing. Since 2011, there have been at least, um, let me see if I have the, there have been at least 10 U.S. military drone crashes in or around Djibouti. Um, accident reports link these events to a multitude of circumstances ranging from component anomalies to faulty parts, weather conditions to pilot inexperience, software glitches to intentional destruction. Um, on May 15, 2011, a predator returning from a classified mission overran the runway at Djibouti Airport and crashed through a fence, causing about $1.3 million in damages. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through some of these. Um, nearly two months later, um, how am I doing for time? Do I have like 10, 15 minutes? Or? Okay, all right. Um, Predator returning from a classified, uh, nearly two months later on May 7, 2011, a predator plummeted into the Gulf of Aden 1.5 hours after takeoff due to component failure, resulting in a $4.4 million loss. Ten days later, another predator failed. It had flown for about 17 hours and was directed to return to base early because of an oil leak, yet pilots had um, trouble identifying the runway on the approach at night because of low clouds and high humidity. The Predator and Hellfile missile on board exploded on impact for a total loss of about three million dollars. Um, there are a whole bunch of these stories that I try to go through, um, and I'm not going to go through all these details, but sometimes what will happen is that um, they, they perform, the commanders will perform what's called a hard ditch where they don't want the drone parts to remain intact so that anybody could get their hands on them. So if there's a problem operationally, they'll make sure it just like, goes really hard into the ocean, that it will be um, intentionally plummeted and destroyed. So declassified, um, these declassified uh, US Air Force accident reports contain some of the most detailed, publicly available information about U.S. drone operations in the Horn of Africa. So you, in order to get the detail, you have to think, think about when they fail, and then suddenly the U.S. is willing to make some of this, more, this information available, although not all. There is some stuff that's classified. These, these reports, they recount the accidents, they convey information about the drone's technical specifi specifications, the personnel and the bases involved, the maintenance history on the drone, the training work and medical history of all the pilots, the weather conditions, the cost and damages of the losses. As the accident report establishes the parties involved, what went wrong and who is at fault, it becomes a part of the U.S. military's audit culture. 
Failure analysis is conducted from the perspectives of US military personnel to refine drone crew, drone crew performance, to improve technical standards in manufacturing, to assess costs, and uh, they do all these things, but they never really question the, the, um, the purpose of the drone operations in the first place. So you'll have, um, You'll have these kinds of, uh, I'm not going to go through all the pages, but you'll have like a table of contents and then it had, there are all the photos and videos related to every class, crash is classified, but you have a lot of the, the textual information. So photos and cockpit video accompanying accident reports remain classified, but on September 24th, 2013, the Washington Post published eight U.S. Air Force photos of two drone crash scenes in Djibouti with an article that expressed dismay over the frequency of U.S. drone accidents there. Seven of the photos show a predator crash near a residential area in Djibouti, and these are just some of them. Um, a wide shot of the crash site shows the smashed predator belly up in the dirt with its casing punctured and bent. Four other photos show close-ups of the object in ruins, honing in on its frayed interior circuitry, damaged landing gear, and crunched mechanical parts. These grounded views exceed the logics of the audit-oriented accident report and demonstrate the fragility of the predator. Two of the photos feature human onlookers, delineating different epistemological positions in relation to the drone crash scene. The first, which is here, shows a team of investigators huddled near their SUVs with the crash scene marked off by yellow police tape, as if part of an official forensic unit. Another photo reveals about 70 curious Djiboutian onlookers standing on the site perimeter and staring at the dead drone in the distance, positioning the drone crash as an experience that punctuates the life worlds of Djiboutian citizens and residents. The photo situates them as silhouettes on the horizon, as remote sensors of a US drone accident in their own backyard. Only 7.9% of Djiboutians have internet access, and 6.5% have Facebook pages. Yet numerous news reports indicate the Arab Spring protests had a radiating effect on Djiboutian youth, inspiring them to organize demonstrations against their president in an effort to reclaim their nation's political future. While I have not found extensive evidence of Djiboutian opposition to US drone operations, in 2013, 600 janitorial and food service workers waged a strike outside Camp Le Monnier after hundreds of jobs were terminated by the new private military contractor KBR. Djibouti's foreign minister, Mahmoud al Yusuf, acknowledges that his country has become one of the top targets of al Shabaab in the region. D U.S. drone operations turn individuals into spectral suspects and host countries into targets. Okay, and now I'm just going to tell you one more forensic example and then I think I'm, I'm getting close to being done. So you, U.S. drones have also, in, in addition to just failing and becoming these kind of incidental weapons within Djibouti neighborhoods, um, the drones themselves have also been targeted by al-Shabaab. So um, on May 23rd, 2013, a U.S. 100 camcopter drone, you see it here, crashed in Somalia near the lower Shabelle region, uh, near the shore of Mogadishu. The drone's mission uh, is classified, but the manufacturer's press release and technical demonstration on YouTube indicates its aerial sensor, loudspeaker, and leafleting um, are used for psyops. Do you guys know what psyops are? Psychological operations. This is when the US military will go in and want to change the kind of ideological mindset and culture of civilians where it's conducting operations. So it will go in with propaganda and it does so through leafleting, like it'll drop uh, paper messages from the skies, or it will use radio, television, and now it's using drones with loudspeakers to go in and do leafleting and actual audio projection into an area, like radio coming down from the sky. 
And so this is known as psyops or psychological operations is the short. So this thing was manufactured to conduct psyops and was in, uh, was shot down or it, it failed or it's not clear exactly what happened to it. So whether the down drone was performing psyops in Somalia reigns, remains an open question. Suffice it to say, members of Al-Shabaab posted several photos of the drone's ruins on its English language Twitter account, boasting, this one will not spy on Muslims again. Um, so much for the empty rhetoric of the drone program. Another picture, the militant group added um, this quote, this one is off to the scrapyard, Scheibel, and Scheibel is the Austrian manufacturer, US was the operator of the drone. You are fighting a losing battle, Islam will prevail. So, I mean, I, I mention this because I think it's really important to think about this vertical field as a contested field, and that it's not like once US drones are operating, there will not be responses from the ground up. And uh, whether it's trying to remove them from the sky um, or um, you know, create an art project that tries to raise awareness about the political implications of these systems. So I just have, um, so the drone crash and the documentation of and response to it are crucial aspects of vertical mediation. These practices range from official accident reports to civilians on looking at crash scenes in their neighborhoods to militants posting ruined drone photos on Twitter. They are important for multi multiple reasons. These forensic examples I'm suggesting are important for multiple reasons. First, they expose the kinds of drones being operated and where they are being operated. Second, they highlight drone materialities, reminding us that unmanned and autonomous technologies are still subject to the laws of gravity, software glitches, and bad weather, and they also have enemies. Finally, given that, the dr given that drone strike photos and assessments in the Horn of Africa do not circulate and there is limited reporting at such sites, the drone crash scene stands in as a symbolic reminder of these concealed sites, as well as the dead or injured bodies that are invisible or uncounted um, and have been disappeared, I mean, in a sense, that were not who knows how accurate these casualty counts are. It's really hard for people to report on what's happening in these regions and to circulate that information. So there's a way in which these operations are disappearing the injured and the dead, in a sense. Um, so this strategy, I want to suggest, is symptomatic of the US, drone, the U.S. military drone program more generally. It is achieved not only by using infrared images to watch bodies die and slowly disappear, but also by using Hellfire missiles to incinerate bodies on contact so that there are no remains left to identify or count except with DNA analysis or by sweeping in to remove bodily remains from strike scenes so locals are unable to confirm who is missing or honor the dead, or by waging US drone wars in secret so that no one knows where or when bodies will be targeted or hit. So within this kind of a context, I would suggest that these drone crash scene photos take on a kind of vital function. They, they, they sort of stand in for processes that in general tend to be um, classified or invisible to us. Um, so we might think of this as, as, as part, of, as an extension of the social body, the human body. Okay, a quick conclusion and then I have just a, a few slides of an art project that I want to mention. So I've, pre I've presented an analysis of vertical mediation and U.S. military drone operations in the Horn of Africa to draw attention to material dimensions of drone warfare. First, I focused on the infrastructural to highlight the vital role of airstrips, the vertical layering of systems like mobile phone systems and drone systems, and the commandeering of commercial mobile tele telephony. Second, I used the perceptual to explore how drone, in, drone imagery, infrared imagery, extends racialization um, beyond epidermalization using temperature-based images to cast all human bodies as blotches of light or dark that stand out in the visual field as spectral subjects, spectral suspects. In these images, individuals may have unique patterns of life, but death appears the same. As the body loses its temperature, it recedes into surrounding matter and disappears. 
And finally, turning to the forensic, I explored how drone, crashed, drone crashes mark the Earth's surface while exposing and intensifying information flows around and responses to secret US drone operations in Africa. All the while, I tried to share examples of ways people on the ground have responded to and contested these US drone operations. Um, so I wanted to just close by, I, I have a longer conclusion that's more theoretical, but I think I'm just gonna, I wanna draw your attention. I've had the privilege over the last few months of collaborating with some artists who are based in Beirut. Um, there is an exhibition coming up at the station gallery <coughs> Um, it's opening on April 30th of this month, and I think it will last for about a week, and it's called Vertical Collisions. Um, I've been working with me, these, these, this project sort of formed uh, by virtue of past collaborations and a desire to collaborate again uh, with Miha Vipatnik, who's, he, who's here in Beirut, a, a very well-known Slovenian artist, um, and also Eli Muhana, who's an emerging Lebanese artist. These are some Skypes with him, and I'll show you a couple more images in a moment. Um, but we are working, based on some of this research, I, in addition to trying to publish as a scholar and academic, I think it's also really important to find different ways for one to present their research findings um, and to present work that moves outside of the academic environment. So we've been working on a multimedia installation um, that involves, uh, here's a kind of schematic, a rough schematic, but it will be this massive body sent to me and at first I was like oh I can't get a sense of scale and then you see his hand touching it and this thing is just gigantic and as we were talking via Skype one of the things that he mentioned to me that I thought was really important and profound was as he's been by himself crocheting this giant how, how lar long is it? Four meters and a half long body Make it, really trying to think through how long does it take to make a body and how long does it take to destroy it. And so this project has a kind of collaborative, international, multimedia dimensions, but at the core there's something also about like, you know, the death drive that's underpinning this regime of drone warfare. Um, yesterday I had the privilege of actually visiting uh, Eli at his house with Miha and seeing this thing in progress. So you're, you're seeing it before in process right now. And this will eventually be suspended from the ceiling. It's actually quite heavy too because it's all made out of aluminum. And um, then in addition, we've been working with Mark Abu Farat with Miha and Mark. Um, these are students also that Miha has been working with um, on uh, uh, some video projections where we are sampling a lot of the declassified or leaked drone footage online and then compositing it and this is this is just a still there will, this will be moving images that's then projected around this gigantic crocheted aluminum uh, corpse um, it should be quite interesting and I, I hope I can see pictures of the final thing because I won't be here I'm sad about that but um, it's these are some of the other just stills where it's, you know, conceptually there's a, an issue about having an overload of information as I tried to get into the talk, and then how, which parts are redacted, which parts are intelligible. How do we as publics read these images and make sense of them once they circulate online? What are we willing to do with them? Um, or will we just archive them and set them aside? Or will we use them as a cause for interrogation of the kinds of um, militarized drone operations that have been happening covertly for more than a decade now, and now the world knows, and we're starting to have international conversations about the illegality of these operations and the human costs of them as well. So um, we have this project as a way of trying to extend the conversation beyond university environments and get broader constituencies and publics involved um, in Beirut and, and, and other places. So um, with that, I will just say thank you for all of you for your time and attention.
Any questions or comments or, yeah? So do you, you know, one of the things maybe some people don't completely appreciate is, I mean, are so aware of here is like exactly how classified everything about this is. So maybe just maybe very briefly just describe a little bit about the classification regime and then how, a little more about how you are working into this heavily secret, heavily denied, uh, you know, yeah. misrepresented kind of globalized operation. Yeah, no, uh, it, it, you know, I, I rely on journalists who are doing investigative reporting, people like Jane Mayer, Scahill, and Greenwald. There are um, some documents that pop up if you look at WikiLeaks. Um, some of the collections that have been made available on WikiLeaks have information about U.S. operations. Um, even in the diplomatic cables, there will be some stuff that has come up. Um, but it is hard. One of the things I would like to do, because a lot of my research, even though I'm in media studies and I do a lot of work about images and audiovisual culture, I like to do uh, field work. And so I, at some point, would like to go to Djibouti and do some documentation of what's happening around there and how, and some ethnographic research interviewing people that live in Djibouti to find out what they think about this. I mean, it's just an area that we don't know because it's not reported, at least in a kind of global news media culture. Um, maybe some of you are more familiar with that than I am, living closer to, to this region. But it is a big challenge doing um, research on classified projects. And you, I, I've, I've had long conversations with Brandon Bryant. He happens to be from my uh, hometown in, in Missoula, Montana. <laughs> and so I've met with him multiple times. And he has, because he has come out, um, uh, you know, as a drone operator in public, and he's done a lot of talks in Europe. He gets hate mail like crazy from the military community. He's been banished. Um, he has had life threats. He's been beaten up. Um, so people that work within the drone crew community that then have some sort of sense of moral conscience and want to think about what it means to be killing in this way, once they start talking, their compatriots within that community act out very aggressively toward them. Um, so, yeah, didn't maybe directly answer your, your question, but it is tricky to do. You just hope that more stuff gets leaked. That's, you, you kind of sit by your computer waiting for leaks. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm sorry to be asking about something for which, the uncertainty of which you pointed out several times, but when it comes to the perceptual and especially mm -hmm. with strategic leaking and the availability of much of this footage online, I wanted to ask you, have you probed some of the reactions, especially to such impersonal, objective um, footage, the, the reactions by the American public or people of Somalia, for example, to this kind of the, the, how the images are presented and, and, and what they portray? I think this would be a, a great extension of the research to have like some actual infrared images of sites in Somalia and have conversations with Somali publics, you know, small groups of people to get their response to these images. I mean, I, I think it's, it's likely that some of them have probably never seen them and yet there are one, another paper that I've been presenting lately is because of these drone operations and because of like Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda operating in parts of rural Africa especially, I think these people are some of the most surveyed people on the planet, which is a counterintuitive assumption. We think, oh, people that live in London where they have these huge closed circuit surveillance cameras everywhere are the most surveyed people on the planet. I would say no, because if you think about the vertical field, People in these areas, the U.S. military is doing constant satellite reconnaissance and surveillance. They're using drones. And then on the ground, there are, think about Boko Haram, Nigerian state security forces that are monitoring civilians as well as Boko Haram jihadis moving around and inspecting and disciplining behavior in an un untechnologized way. So um, th I think these are, in surveillance studies, which is kind of one of the sub-areas of my research, 
um, the tendency is to focus on the post-industrial West, the internet, um, urban spaces. It is not usually to think about rural environments and rural people in you know, developing contexts. And so in terms of, I, I, this is very much work in progress and the kinds of questions that are being asked about how you work with classified information, how do the people actually you know, what is their understanding of these images or their disposition to them are things that I feel I, I need to still probe further. So I very much appreciate your question. Yes. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times when I've been asking American friends that uh, you know, the lack, the kind of increasing lack of privacy with the Patriot Act, and they would, you know, the response would, I'm just going to follow up on his question, the response would be, well, like, you know, first of all, you don't mind, there's nothing to hide, and it's a small price to pay for security. And I'm wondering whether a lot of people that are being overly surveyed would have the same type of reaction. Like, yeah as a kind of, you know, trade-off to right. security. Yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if you don't have the answer to that, but I just curious. No, I, I think the, the question about, you know, these concerns about surveillance and privacy and security. I have talked to people who say, oh, why are you talking about surveillance? This is a Western obsession. We, you know, people in different parts of the world do not have that the same kind of, um, you know, overvaluation of privacy that comes with a kind of the particular political economic formation, say, in the United States, right? Um, however, I, I, we can't be that reductive and simple because the U.S. is made up of all kinds of immigrant communities and people with different, you know, some people live really close, some people have huge estates. There are different ways that people think about these issues. Um, so I'm, I think I'm losing track of your, your question. No, that's but fine. I mean, I, it wasn't, it was just more common. Yeah, I, I, I'm mindful as I'm doing research on this that, um, that some of the preoccupation with surveillance tends to be about Western property ownership, whether you want to talk about that about one's home or one's intellectual property, the sort of sacredness of one's digital identity. Um, that I found from traveling and giving talks like this um, that not everybody has those proclivities in the same way, and that people have radically different ways of thinking, um, not only about these surveillance issues, but just even about free, quote unquote, free speech and, and censorship questions too. And there are certain trade-offs, and whenever we're talking about surveillance, we can think about totalitarian tendencies on the one end in surveillance studies, and then at the other end, people talk about surveillance as being part of an ethics of care, and that in, in light of the globalization of weapons, that there is a need for some kind of security systems in place. Yes? Uh, there's a new court case called uh, The Only Guy Three Times, the reference to the James Bond, The Only Guy Three which indicates that it takes three spikes for the target to be hit. And that statistically, that's from another source, there's an average of 40 collateral deaths per strike. So that's mm -hmm. 120 people based on cell phone use, heat, and what the, the, the guy from that is hoping is the bad guy, according to whom, I don't know. So <coughs> isn't that too much of a, I don't know, gamble, coincidence to be defended either ethically or legally or whatever? I, I, uh, personally, I think yes, it is too. I think it's very risky. And I mean, I think that, you know, one thing that I try to remind myself is that it's okay just to have a hardline position and be anti war, <laughs> too. You know, I, I don't feel the need to rationalize my opposition to this form of warfare. Like, I, um, but. A lot of people say, oh, we live in a particular kind of historical conjunction, conjuncture of the war on terror, and how are we going to contend with the kinds of violence that's happening? Um, I don't know how to answer your question other than to say any kind of collateral damage to me is unacceptable. I mean, really. <laughs> I just, when you think about all the civilians that are dying, not only because of drone warfare, but other kinds of war going on, right across the border, um, it's, it's not okay. <laughs> and it's okay to say it's not okay. 
Um, I don't think we have to be socialized into a world where we think that war is just part of the order of things. Um, I, I, refuse to, I refuse to be interpolated in that way. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Yeah. Um, something you mentioned briefly was the use of Hellfire missiles. Yeah. And yes. It's kind of reminiscent of Osama bin Laden's uh, body being promptly disposed of and wiping out the legacy, in this case symbolic, but in cases of average militants or civilians being targeted. I mean, that wiping out the energy signature becomes completely compatible with wiping out material signature. Yes. And what, what are your thoughts? Can you elaborate on it, please? Well, you know, Paul Virilio is a French philosopher. Maybe you've heard of him. Have you guys heard of Paul Virilio? He, and he's been thinking about these issues for a long time. And he has a whole book called The Aesthetic of Disappearance. And he's very interested in how the political regime changes when we have communication that happens around the world at the speed of light, you know, like where things are happening so quickly and all of that, those systems are rapidly militarized as well. But I, I do think we have to be tracking these new regimes of disappearance that are happening in the context of incinerating the bodies of victims so that they are uncountable, um, you know, that, that they're unrecognizable, uncountable, no longer there to honor um, in, in uh, it's it's part of it's symptomatic of a broader regime of wanting to do away with evidence of the, that can be used to try the perpetrator like that's why we end up here in this talk with the forensic because the forensic <coughs> we, we only see what only cir circulates forensically in the horn of africa material is are the dr fallen drones not the fallen humans. Those images are all classified. We will probably never see them if they are unless they are leaked. And so my argument is we have to use these fallen drones as a kind of substitution, a symbolic substitution for what we are not seeing. And I think trying to come up with a broader you know, understanding of this politics of disappearance, the way that death in the thermal mediascape is literally looks different and, and unintelligible in terms of the way we've been socialized to see and perceive death, how it's being recodified and what the political implications of that are, are really important. And I think the people who also face this on the front lines are people who, in NGOs who are trying to, like Bureau of Investigative Journalism, the people in villages where drone strikes are happening regularly, who are showing up at these scenes and finding they have no idea how many bodies to report dead because all they see are fragments or incinerated ash. And how, I mean, we have to imagine ourselves coming upon a scene like that and the, and the horror of that and, and how, how the horror of that never seems to travel through the internet, right? Like, how can we access, um, what it would be like to go to your hometown and find that not are people dead, but there are the, you know that there were bodies there, but they're not there. And this is happening not only through Hellfire Missile, but there are these teams that sweep in on helicopter and, and remove evidence for their own records and da damage assessments and after action report documentation, which is all classified. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you for the talk. It's very engaging. Um, I don't know if you uh, I have a couple of questions or maybe uh, remarks. I don't know if you know about the pop song that came out of Pakistan, which in which uh, uh, the singer actually it's a love song where the singer is saying, uh, "Your gaze, my gaze is as lethal as a drone strike." I don't know if you've read about it. Yes, I have a whole other paper, and I talk about oh, that okay. film. Yeah, okay. about yeah, that's very interesting. Because it actually also materializes the local conceptions and so on, and and, um, and I'm wondering whether what what the questions that are raised are actually about also an impossibility of imagination, or maybe fiction is needed actually in order to bridge the 
uh, maybe to, to, to make people who are not prone to drone strikes more aware. Yeah. I mean, if policing in the United States became like that, for example, would that, how would people react? Right. That's how. Thanks for your comments. Um, yes, I, I think um, fiction is often more powerful <laughs> in terms of getting people to imagine the importance or significance or stakes of the situation. Um, and, you know, I, I think that piece that you mentioned, that short video, I have it, I, I can show it if people want to see it, if they're interested, it's very short. Um, um, but it was one of the most powerful things I came across. And it wasn't just, it, it, it integrates some actual photographs, but it's, it's more of a, it's almost like a La Jete by Chris Marker. I don't know if you know that. But I think it, it, Finding ways, um, you know, I'm in the humanities, I'm in film and media studies, and, and I have a belief in the imagination and the need for alternative imaginings to solve complex <coughs> political problems. We don't just have to inherit the systems that are there. We can reimagine them and, and we can use, you know, our own writing, our own photography, our own film narratives to try to work through some of these issues and, and <coughs> offer solutions or, or different ways of thinking about problems that maybe have, we've grown, you know, have, uh, we, we tend to be reductive about. So I very much appreciate your comment. Hatem? I've never seen you give a talk that I haven't liked. <laughs> and one of the things I really appreciated about um, this particular way of thinking about drones is actually this, these three levels that you're thinking the infrastructural, perceptual, perceptual, and forensic. And one of the things that I think this helps us really, or help me at least, to really understand are precisely the power geometries that accompany strategies of coercion and, and rule that, that drones are a part of, which would help us to see how drones are one particular communication node in that. I've never, I haven't heard about embedding the, the cell tower inside the drone form. Um, but one of the things I'm wondering is, yeah. you know, I, I share your, your enthusiasm for the imagination. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the wrong way to phrase that. But, no, yeah. um, the, one of the things that I think this helps us see very differently is the status of blackness <coughs> in the materialization of these kinds of digital media networks. That there's a very different status to liveness in specific lived spaces. And there's also a very different type of trace which is left, be it either in government documents which are redacted, traces on the ground, traces left on drone operators who, like mm -hmm. I really like stress that this is not like a video game that people who are drone operators, I've heard Peter, people like Peter Asaro talk about how yeah. these guys end up with what, by all accounts, is PTSD air rates that are far higher and certainly anybody else in the Air Force, or, mm -hmm. or even people who, were, who ran um, bombing missions in World War II, that they suffer from what the military calls burnout at a much higher rate than, and that's the end of my rank slash. Yeah, no, thanks for your comments. And I, I, I do think keeping a kind of flexibility in the way that we think about liveness and the trace, and I mean, Whenever I read that sentence at the outset where I sort of think it's not so much a video game, it's like a 3D printer, I always feel a little nervous because it sounds a little, might come off as a little like trite or silly, but I really do think these things are, you know, like these sort of engines that are being orchestrated to remediate the surface of the earth and the, the sort of social life worlds and economies on it. So it's this very dynamic um, physical process that involves both live dynamic activity as well as traces that um, register across these different kinds of fields. So thanks for picking up on those two things. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that IR imaging and, and all the technology that goes with has been not only performative but intrinsically from, the, from its cradle militarized. What um, do you have any um, problems with the very existence of, of, of systems of surveillance and information gathering this at this scale, or only the the, the performative aspects of, of or its precursor? 
I wouldn't say that I have some kind of fundamental objection to any technology, maybe nuclear weapons. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think all technologies can be used in a multitude of ways, and I try to keep an open political Im imagination about how things might be used. Um, there's a tendency for the, the, this particular arrangement of drones and telecommunication networks to perpetrate a regime of targeted killing that is very problematic. Um, but one could say one need not use the technology in that configuration, right? There might be other ways of organizing the technology. Um, so I try to stay quite flexible about like, trying to revision the way that it might be organized in an alternate fashion. Um, and, yeah. All right, since we're out of time, can I say okay. that um, we'll applaud in one moment, but since Miha, uh, um, sorry, Miha Kopotnik and Ellie Mohan are here, if people want to chat with the artists or Lisa for a few minutes, we can do something. But let's yeah. thank Lisa Parks for a brilliant talk. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks for coming.